And good evening. Tonight, the death toll soaring in Florida, five days after Hurricane Ian made landfall as a massive Cat 4 storm. More than 100 people are now confirmed dead. The destruction is staggering as we get a first look at some of the hardest hit areas. In Matt Lachey, a home nearly toppling into the bay, you see it there. Roads buckling under the force of that storm surge. And in Fort Myers Beach, officials say not one of their 3,500 properties were left unscathed. Search and rescue teams, they're risking their own lives as they move through homes that could collapse at any moment. More than 1,600 people pulled from the destruction across the state. First responders using helicopters, boats, and going door to door to bring people to safety. Crews working around the clock to restore power, but more than half a million customers still without electricity. Even more still without internet. Crews now reaching those barrier islands with amphibious vehicles. You see them here. Our Kerry Sanders right there with them. He'll have more in a moment. But we begin first with Sam Brock and those dangerous rescue efforts now underway. Tonight, a gut-wrenching look at Fort Myers Beach from the ground level for the first time since Hurricane Ian made landfall. No structure on this island has gone unscathed. Our cameras, the first to tour what's now just frames of homes, unrecognizable lots with nothing left except air conditioning units, toilets, and rubble. The International Association of Firefighters, President Edward Kelly, leading us through the wreckage. This island was devastated. He says there are 10 search and rescue units on the ground, comprised of hundreds of firefighters. Search and rescue! Searching 3,500 properties just in Fort Myers Beach. How long do you think that's going to go on for? You know, it's a common question, um, and a lot of people want to know a time frame. And unfortunately, time frames are very dynamic, they're fluid. As you look at the thousands of properties on Fort Myers Island, they basically run the gamut from homes that look like they're pretty much still standing to piles of rubble that have to be sifted through layer by layer to other properties that look structurally unsafe. And all of them require a different approach and delicacy to go through. Rescue, anybody here? Anybody need help? For homes at risk of collapse, the process can take hours to protect anybody that could still be inside as well as the emergency responders. We don't want to create more victims and more victims from the storm and more victims from the rescuers. But criticism is growing around when Lee officials called for those evacuations. The National Hurricane Center cited life-threatening storm surge for Fort Myers at 5 p.m. Monday. On Tuesday morning, the first mandatory orders were issued and expanded throughout the day. I think that was a little late. I think it should have been like Monday, sometime Monday, because this is such a low-lying area. Um, and even though it was hitting Tampa, Tampa's right there. It's their whole life. People don't want to leave their valuables behind. In the midst of this dark chapter, All the chairman and CEO of Florida right? Power and Light are says recent changes to the infrastructure happen. will help expediting repairs. We believe we are going to be done with everybody who can accept power and understand there are thousands of structures that will not be able to accept power by the close of business on Friday. A glimmer of light for a community still stunned by so much loss. This is my mother's house. This is my whole life. My mom was supposed to retire here and spend the rest of her life and be happy, and now we have nothing. Now, you feel so bad for those residents. Sam, uh, he joins us now from Fort Myers Beach, Florida. Sam, talk to us about the condition of some of those Ian survivors. We just heard from one there who were essentially stranded after the storm. I can't tell you how many people that I've seen, Tom, driving all around this area that are coming up and saying that they're not having enough access right now to clean water, to food, communication. Communication is huge right now. It is literally a lifeline for people trying to reach their loved ones and trying to get help in. So all of that is important. Although the governor does point out there have been plenty of trips to Sanibel Island and Captiva and some of those other places, and folks have been offered a ride back and have not necessarily gone in many cases. The bigger issue right now, Tom, is finding those people alive or perhaps perished where they might be amidst all of this rubble. Well, that's my next question to you, Sam, as we look at that hellscape there just behind you. Is there a fear that, that they have not been able yet to find or reach people in distress? A thousand percent. And here's the issue right now. Search and rescue crews, Tom, have been here for about five days. The expectation is it's going to be at least another week, because you're talking about 3,000 structures just in Fort Myers, and some of them are, are freestanding homes that are okay. Others are compromised. An engineer has to assess the structural integrity before they can even go inside of it. And then you have these big piles of rubble that have to be pulled away layer by layer. There are void spaces within those layers, and then potentially people within the void spaces, but even going through one of those can take a day, if not more. Now multiply that by the thousands. 
That's what folks here are up against right now, Tom. Sam Brock, who's been leading our coverage from Hurricane Ian for several days. Now, Sam, we appreciate it. Some Florida communities are still largely cut off, as Sam was just telling us about. Carrie Sanders traveled to one of them, St. James City, where people are desperate for supplies and support. This is St. James City. Since last Wednesday when Hurricane Ian hit, this island community has been mostly cut off from contact with the outside world. I haven't seen any help from the government. 72-year-old Joe Lou wrote it out here alone. What would you like people to know? Send help whenever, whatever. His front door looked like a wave pool. The water kept rising. Joe had a life jacket at the ready. Still, hurricanes will not chase him away. Not much you can do about it. That's Florida, hurricanes. St. James City sits at the tip of Pine Island. Its bridge to the mainland, gone. Survivors here say friends with boats in Cape Coral and Fort Myers have taken it upon themselves to render aid. So far, there's been no FEMA water, ice, generators, food. Heather Hoffman made her way here today, finally, to find her dad, Joe, alive. What's that like to finally know? <laughs> um... There's no words, you know, the destruction is mind boggling, but just to know that my loved ones are okay, that's the most important thing. St. James City was hit by the same 10 foot storm surge that took out portions of Sanibel Island's causeway and bridge. We made it to one of the newly formed sand spits where critical infrastructure was washed away. Communications is cut out. You can see the cables behind me like that orange line. It is why cell phone service is so critical. It's why today part of AT&T's 180 member emergency response team, many of them veterans, launched from the mainland and 90 minutes later arrived on Sanibel Island. Tonight they've already powered up two of four cell phone towers here. The National Guard ferrying vehicles and more cell phone equipment in to bring communications back to the area islands. These people have been through a lot and we're here to try to get them to reconnect with their families that are obviously concerned about them. AT&T opened their system in the hurricane zone to anyone with any service so they could text. We've seen 35 terabytes so far from other carriers, which is equivalent to 12 billion SMS messages. An all out effort to help survivors finally reconnect with family. At some point, all of this destruction becomes visually numbing, but I still want to just show you the power of the storm surge that here you have a two by four that flew into what is like essentially bulletproof glass. It's hurricane glass. And so you can see the power of what happened when that 10 foot storm surge happened. As I take you through this home, there are those who not only decided to stay put, but they're still on the island and they say they're not going to leave. They want to protect what little is left of their homes. In many cases, they'll be sleeping outside tonight, again, on mattresses, some of them damp mattresses. Uh, but the good news, the good news is, is that the tower over on Sanibel Island is strong enough that it's sending a signal here. So they have cell phone service. And with a couple generators here, they hope to be able to call out. And essentially, St. James City is now on the radar. Tom? Carrie Sanders for us. Incredible people are trying to live out there. All right, Carrie, for more on the remnants of Ian, which we've been feeling up here in the Northeast all weekend, I want to bring in NBC meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, it was nothing like what happened in Florida, no. but but it was definitely windy all weekend. Uh, we've had six straight days of coastal flooding where we've had a little damage. The dunes are getting eroded, and that's happening again. Now, the remnants turned into what we call almost like a nor'easter type storm, and it is just sitting right off the mid-Atlantic. It has been raw. It has been cloudy. Every high tide cycle, we're just taking chunks of the beach away. In some cases, water on roadways that are impassable. Many of the houses and homes are doing okay. So here's the coastal flood warnings from the Jersey Shore areas of Delaware, Maryland, down through the Norfolk, Virginia Beach areas. About one to two feet of storms, almost like a storm surge kind of. When we're at high tide, that's how much higher the water is than it should be. So again, we're not ruining homes, but we are going to see it on roadways and stuff. You know, we're just a problem really if you live right at the beach. So here's how this is all going to play out with this storm. So this is tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Be prepared for a slow morning commute, D.C., Philly, Baltimore to New York. 
York. By the time we get to tomorrow evening, still kind of in those same areas, maybe rotating a little bit north. It's just sitting there. So you know, if you're in the mid-Atlantic or northeast, you may not see the sun until Thursday, and it disappeared as we went through Friday. Even by 5 p.m., and then by the time we get into Wednesday, starts to move away a little bit and get a tiny bit better. But ever we have a big storm, everyone's always like, all right, we're still in hurricane season. What's next? We have two areas of interest, a 30% chance of formation on this one, 70% with the one off Africa. I'm not concerned with either of them at this time in the next week being anywhere near the U.S. Yeah, both those systems need to take their time. Yeah. As we were watching Kerry and Sam report there, Bill, you know, we, we realized how sunny it is over there. These people yeah. have no power. How hot is it right now on the west coast of Florida? Yeah, October is still a very hot, humid month in much of you know, Florida. In the wake of the storm, the humidity has actually been unusually low. So that's helping people that don't have power in their houses open up the windows. It's been getting down to the upper 50s and 60s. But that's not going to last forever. So for Tuesday, 81, 81 at Fort Myers, that's doable. But by the time we get to the end of the week, we go to 85. And then, you know, by the weekend, back up into the upper 80s and more humid. All right, Bill, we appreciate that. Thank you. While Florida recovers from Hurricane Ian's devastation, you may remember Puerto Rico is still trying to rebuild from Hurricane Fiona. The storm killed at least 25 people last month and knocked out the island's power grid. In a visit today, President Biden pledged $60 million in federal aid to help Puerto Rico rebuild. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is there. In the storm-ravaged mountains of southwestern Puerto Rico, Maricel Lugo Ortiz has no power, no patience, and she's running low on insulin. Are you desperate? Está desesperada. Yes, she says, telling us she waited on hold for FEMA for hours. More than two weeks after Hurricane Fiona swept through Puerto Rico, today President Biden and the First Lady visited the island. We're going to make sure you get every single dollar promised. The president announcing $60 million in funding to shore up levees, strengthen flood walls, and create a new flood warning system. But some Puerto Ricans wonder whether that'll be enough. You don't have uh, any any hope. It's uh, you, you, you feel hopeless because you don't know what's going on. Luma Energy, the company that took over power distribution in Puerto Rico last year, says it's restored electricity to 93% of its customers here. We've taken over a system that has been uh, pretty much neglected for years. Still, some mayors did not wait for Luma, hiring their own contractors to restore power. What do you say to the Puerto Ricans on the island who just don't trust Luma? They need to give us a chance and they need to see what we are doing. With her generator still running this morning, Marisol Rodriguez felt forgotten after yet another storm. Pero Luma. This was no Hurricane Maria, she said, but the people of Puerto Rico are suffering. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from San Edmund, Puerto Rico. And Gabe, we look there behind you. We can still see some of the damage on the island. As you've mentioned before, about 93% of, of Puerto Ricans there have their power back. But what's going to happen to the other 7% as we know some mayors have taken sort of this issue into their own hands? Uh, yeah, that's right, Tom. Look, the governor has been very reluctant to put a firm timetable on when power will be restored. But Luma Energy says that it hopes to have it back in the coming days. But for communities like this one, they are still spending another night without power. This is San Herman in the southwestern part of the island. You see this road that's been washed out behind me. There was a wall of water that came crashing through here and trapped some of the residents in this community for at least a day. We spoke with that one woman in our story who is still dealing with damage in Insulin. There's a lot of skepticism here in this part of the island about when power might be restored. And yes, several mayors across the island decided to take matters into their own hands and hire their own private contractors because they didn't want to wait on Luma Energy. Tom? Gabe Gutierrez from Puerto Rico. Gabe, we appreciate that. The other big breaking story tonight, former President Donald Trump suing CNN, saying the network defamed him by using labels like racist, insurrectionist, and even Hitler. Trump seeking $475 million in punitive damages, claiming CNN carried out a campaign of libel and slander. I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst right now, Danny Savalos, on this. So, Danny, the big question tonight, does the former president have a case? Let me first say, I used to be a CNN contributor, so I'm biased. I like yeah. the folks over there. But that being said, uh, take it with a grain of salt. I am not buying this lawsuit for several reasons. Uh, number one, defamation cases are always hard to prove. It may be impossible if you're a president to prove defamation because people say all kinds of nasty things about you and they're all subsumed under opinion. But the idea that it, behind this lawsuit is that 
essentially CNN allegedly perpetrated this uh, big lie, and I'm putting that in air quotes, but the idea of the big lie is that it relates back to a principle that Hitler had in Mein Kampf. So essentially the theory of the lawsuit is that by using or branding this big lie, uh, CNN compared the former president to Hitler. That kind of comparison, while if it's true, is hacky, it's been done too much, but the bottom line is it's almost always protected speech. It happens all the time, not saying it's appropriate to compare people to Hitler, but if it's uh, protected speech to compare people to Hitler, especially political figures, then it's probably protected speech to compare something Trump used to a concept in a book written by Hitler a long time ago. CNN has new management now, and it's been reported in multiple outlets that the new management does not want CNN reporters and anchors to use the phrase big lie anymore. Will that help former President Donald Trump's case in any way? In Trump's thinking, it will because, oh, that's an admission that what you did was wrong. But there are dozens of different uh, non-defamatory reasons to no, no longer do that. News organizations rebrand all the time. They cancel and initiate or uh, buy or pr produce new shows all the time. Look, listen to me talking like I'm kid showbiz. I don't know how that works. I'm just a commentator. But the point is the news business changes a lot. Slogans change, uh, directions that news organiz organizations go and change all the time. There are probably plenty of legitimate reasons why uh, CNN decided to go with or lose a particular theme or phrase or catchphrase or whatever uh, that is non-defamatory. And that is going to be a real challenge for the Trump team to show that, hey, if they got rid of this phrase, big lie, it was for the specific reason that they knew they were making a defamatory statement and they were doing so with reckless disregard of the truth. And by the way, you come back to the whole thing that the, the theory is that big lie compares them to Hitler. And because it compares them to Hitler, it is therefore per se. And they use the word automatically per se defamatory in the complaint. And, you know, I've looked at the case law. That's just not the case. I want to pull out a portion of the lawsuit. I'm going to ask our director, Jeff, to put this on the screen for our viewers here. Here's what it, what's at the crux of this lawsuit, right? It says, CNN has undertaken a smear campaign to malign the plaintiff with a barrage of negative associations and innuendos, broadcasting commentary that he is like a cult leader, a Russian lackey, a dog whistler to white supremacists. It goes on to say, and a racist. It is the stuff of tabloids cloaked as honored news. If Trump's team can, can prove there was, there was some kind of effort to at least maybe report the news in a slanted way, does he have a case? But the other question I have is, will CNN want this to even proceed? Because all these reporters and anchors, former news managers are going to possibly be deposed. Or do you think it doesn't even go that far? If I'm advising CNN, and I'm not, I'm no longer at CNN, but I would tell them, take this all the way to trial. Do not settle this case. Because, and throw up that, you'd be, that you'd sound. Be, you'd or that, be okay uh, with all their staffers being deposed if you ran CNN. You, you think that's, that's a good idea? They have to, because this is not, at least from my view, a meritorious complaint. It could get dismissed uh, before it even gets to discovery. Because, for example, you put up that graphic we just said, that quote you just read, right. was fantastic. You know why? Even if all of that is true, that doesn't read as defamatory to me. But what Let's I'm asking you is, slanted. is it worth it to CNN right. to go through all that trouble, get those depositions on camera? You, you never know what the Trump side is going to do, possibly leak that. And it, it could potentially, it might not, but it could potentially look really bad for CNN. Welcome to the conundrum. Welcome to the dilemma of every large corporate defendant. Do we settle this early uh, and you know, l uh, lick our wounds, offer the cost of litigation, and hope the plaintiff goes away? Or do we take this all the way with the attendant risk of p putting our people in depositions? I, I, we, we have to wrap this up, okay. but I have a question. Do you think this advances, or do you think a judge, a judge tosses this out immediately? If I'm CNN, again, I'm not. Move to dismiss, say the complaint what do you doesn't think's state what a do you claim, think's doesn't state a cause of action. And I think CNN has a shot at getting this tossed. Okay. Danny, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Back now with the growing manhunt for a possible serial killer in Northern California. At least five men are dead. Police released a surveillance photo of the potential suspect who may be stalking his victims, including a man killed just last week. NBC News senior national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has those details. 
the seemingly unidentifiable grainy still image capturing only the back of a person of interest is perhaps the best lead police in Stockton, California have. Searching for an apparent serial killer roaming the streets, police say five men have already been shot to death and fear the next victim could come any day. You need to be aware of your surroundings. Be alert. Have your head on a swivel. Calling the murders interconnected, police say their killer is stalking victims as they walk alone after dark in poorly lit areas, spanning a radius of a few square miles. After the first homicide this summer, most came weeks apart, except for the latest murders, separated by only days. The killing spree generating a flurry of headlines, but few leads. While little is known about a suspect or suspects, the victims' lives are coming into focus. He was there for me. I wish I could have watched out for him. Jerry Lopez's big brother Lorenzo was the last known victim. Salvador Dubidi Jr., a loving husband, was one of the first. His wife too scared to show her face. It's been tremendous tragedy for our family, and we just want answers. With police ruling out gang violence, robberies, and hate crimes, an $85,000 reward is being offered for information leading to an arrest. Tonight, the desperate hunt for a serial killer before they strike again. Authorities are now beefing up police presence across the city of Stockton. Investigators are also going over hundreds of hours of doorbell video in the neighborhood where the murders took place. They say they hope they are one big break away from finding their killer. Tom. All right, Miguel Almaguer Force. Miguel, we appreciate it. With the city of Stockton, California on edge, how long will it take authorities to catch the killer? Criminologist Dr. Scott Bond joins us now. He's the author of the book, Why We Love Serial Killers. So, Scott, the first killing happened back in July. How do you think police were able to determine that all five cases might be connected? I would say through ballistics. Uh, this is a shooter. So, and in all likelihood, they've been able to link those crime scenes through uh, ballistic analysis. The five victims don't appear to know each other. At least the police haven't told us that yet. If this is, in fact, a serial killer, is it typical that the victims are not connected? Absolutely. Uh, serial killers typically kill uh, either because they represent a particular profile, um, say, prostitutes uh, wandering the streets or uh, simply because they um, uh, are attracted to them in some way, either physically, sexually, or otherwise. Um, in, in this case, I think that the uh, a, a very strong possible motive is simply the thrill of killing because he seems to be approaching men in the dark uh, where there is uh, you know no there's no guardians around and he's simply shooting them and moving on and so a likely motive here could simply be that he enjoys the act of killing itself scott you know that that image they've released is so strange because it's a surveillance photo but you you can't tell anything i mean i, I don't know if i've ever seen and I've covered a lot of crimes, police releasing something with as little detail as this. I mean, that could be a man, it could be a woman, it could, it, it could be any race. Um, I, I'm just wondering why you think they did this. Great question. And again, the, um, a very likely motive is simply the thrill of killing. Uh, serial killers are motivated by many different things. Different serial killers are motivated by uh, things like uh, sexual attraction. It could be um, a, a gain of some sort, financial, but there's no robbery in this case. Uh, they, these, um, these men are not, uh, uh, it does not appear to be a hate crime in, in any way, the police have said. So I think I Either one of two things, either this individual is, is truly mentally ill and hears a voice that's telling them to kill, or they are simply getting a tremendous satisfaction, as I said, from shooting the act of killing and moving on. There's no attempt to hide the bodies. There's no attempt to cover up their crime. They are simply shooting and moving on. And, um, and they seem to be escalating because uh, there's a shorter and shorter time frame now between killings. So unless apprehended, I hate to say this, but it's very likely that there will be another killing in the near future. Why do you, how can you say that with so much certainty? 
because that's the typical pattern of serial killers uh, that they escalate over time. They don't de-escalate, they, they escalate over time. And he's getting away with it. He has uh, obviously some sort of satisfaction that he's, gain they, he's gaining from this. He may even enjoy the notoriety, the fact that he sees himself in the news, even though it's a grainy photo. And um, so I hate to say it, but, but all of the uh, statistics and history would suggest that the, this individual will kill again in the near future. We, we hope you're wrong, but we do appreciate your analysis. Dr. Scott Bond for us tonight here on Top Story. Scott, thank you. Coming up, the latest on that deadly stadium stampede. Did you hear about this? More than 125 people killed in the crush after a soccer match in Indonesia. The punishments just handed down to the police officers there. And the Ayatollah breaking his silence about those growing protests in Iran while he's aiming the blame at the U.S. with no proof for the unrest in his own country. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories Newsfeed. We begin with the Supreme Court back in session today for the first time since that highly controversial decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. New Justice Kentanji Brown Jackson hearing her first arguments, actively engaging in questioning in a case related to the environment and clean water. On the docket for later in the term, consequential cases on affirmative action, voting rights, and LGBT discrimination. Three people are dead in Minnesota after a small plane crash into a home. The Cessna slamming into the house's second story late Saturday night, just a mile away from the Duluth International Airport. The pilot and both passengers on board, who were siblings, all killed. Two residents inside the home at the time were miraculously unharmed. The FAA and NTSB are now investigating this crash. And country music singer Hardy is recovering after his tour bus flipped over on a highway near Nashville. Hardy and three others on board rushed to the hospital after the crash early Sunday. The singer tweeting that all of them were treated for, quote, significant injuries and that the driver is still hospitalized. No word yet if Hardy, who was recently named Country Music Songwriter of the Year, will be forced to cancel upcoming shows. We want to turn out of the war in Ukraine, where some Russian-controlled territories in the Kherson region are now back under Ukrainian control. Russian military leaders now forced to acknowledge these losses. Aaron McLaughlin has the latest. Tonight, Ukrainian forces say they're now making stunning gains to the south, liberating two territories in the occupied Kherson region. Just days after a victory in the eastern town of Leman, hoisting the Ukrainian flag and tearing Russian signs down from areas where just days ago, Russian President Putin declared the Ukrainian territory would be Russia's forever. A long way to break through in a bloody war that's potentially entering a new phase. While liberated areas have been left devastated by Russian occupation, including the village of Kamyanka, this man says a bomb blew a 30-foot hole in his backyard. How did you survive? I don't know, he says. Russian state TV now bluntly warning its viewers we should not be expecting good news and airing this video of draftees training before heading to Ukraine. But around half of the soldiers conscripted in a region of the Far East now being sent home after being deemed unfit, according to a Russian official. The leader of Chechnya releasing this footage, claiming to show his teenage sons, including his 14-year-old, preparing for war. Days after the Putin ally called for Russia to use low-yield nuclear weapons on the battlefield. Tonight in a rare admission, Russia's defense ministry acknowledging what it called Ukraine's superior tank units wedging into the depths of Russia's defenses in occupied Kherson. Tom. All right, we thank Aaron for that report. And you just heard about the Chechen leader speaking out in support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But some elite soldiers from the Chechen Republic now fighting against Russia, fighting on Ukraine's side. NBC senior national correspondent Jay Gray spoke with several of these war-hardened soldiers and has their story. They are some of the most fierce, most feared soldiers in the world. A lot of people in the United States, in Europe, everywhere in the world, they still believe that we are some uh, crazy radicals, that we are uh, barbarians. But these Chechen fighters shared this video from the front lines. Evidence, they say, that reputation is wrong. <laughs> Pointing to these clips of Ukrainians cheering as they help to liberate the occupied town of Izum. This young soldier telling me, it means that we're fighting on the right side. We are fighting for the truth. It means for me that people can live a normal life something they never had in Chechnya. 
decades of resistance ending with Russian troops taking control of their ravaged homeland. They destroy each Chechenian village, each Chechenian uh, city, and we don't have any family who don't lost brother, mother, sister, father, grandfather. That loss and horror mirrored in the battered towns and villages, the constant attacks and atrocities unfolding in Ukraine. The commander of the unit, now leading troops to war for the third time against Russia, and never more confident that they will win, saying, we are surely going to because the whole world is behind us and supports us. There is, though, little if any support from the place they were forced to leave. I'm not happy that uh, people with same blood, with same language dying on the other side. Thousands of Chechens have been drafted or volunteered, now fighting alongside Russian troops, highlighted by the leader of the Chechen Republic's threatening comments this weekend in support of Vladimir Putin. Traitor is more dangerous than Russian soldiers, because this traitor, he traitor our nation, he traitor our culture, and he just want to kill all of us. <laughs> They are willing to risk their lives for that culture, and they say, an even bigger cause. We fight for our freedom. All right, Jay Gray joins Top Story tonight from Kyiv. So, Jay, how many of these Chechen soldiers are there fighting alongside the Ukrainian soldiers? And based on your reporting on the ground, how are they tactically assisting with this current surge? Yeah, it's interesting, Tom. They won't give you exact numbers for security reasons, but do say there are several dozen that are on the ground in different areas across the front lines. They go out in small elite strike units, maybe a dozen or so, and they are deployed, of course, by uh, Ukraine soldiers and Ukraine units. They're all going to the front lines, being used to help liberate some of these villages and towns that they are moving into during the counteroffensive. So, Jay, you know, we've seen this reporting about the, the, the leader of Chechnya and, and, and essentially how he's siding with Vladimir Putin. Our viewers may have noticed yeah. some of the blurred out faces there. Can you talk to us, though, about, about how, how important it was not to disclose their identities because it's such a delicate situation. We're talking about life or death here. We absolutely are, Tom. And one thing that they made clear is it's more for the protection of their families or, or their extended families, some, some who still may be in Chechnya, and they want to make sure that they protect uh, their families wherever they may be. And, of course, obviously, they don't want to give up uh, their uh, names or identities either because they know so many people that are involved in this fight. So it's, it's all security. But, again, they stress repeatedly it's about their extended families and concerns about what may happen happen to them if it's known that they're fighting for Ukraine. Jay Gray with a fresh new story out of the battle zone. Jay, we appreciate it. We thank you for that. Coming up, the election too close to call. A runoff declared in Brazil. We'll tell you about the high stakes showdown between the leftist challenger and the president many call a Brazilian version of Donald Trump. Stay with us. We're back now with two stories coming out of the Americas. We start with the heated presidential election in Brazil. The race so close that a runoff election is now set. Voters facing a decision between former leftist president Luis Inacio Lula da Silva and incumbent far-right president Jair Bolsonaro. These men with two vastly different visions for the largest country in Latin America. A consequential vote that is NBC's Gotti Schwartz report is being plagued with misinformation and fraud allegations. Tonight, all eyes are on Brazil as the largest country in Latin America prepares to elect its new president. On Sunday, over 100 million Brazilians showed up to the polls. Incumbent conservative leader Jair Bolsonaro and former leftist president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. This is the most important election in Brazilian history. While Lula finished the night ahead with 48% of the votes, it was a strong showing by Bolsonaro that shocked analysts, earning 43% of the votes and beating all odds in polls that originally predicted him to be out in the first round, with one major poll giving Lula a 14-point lead prior to the election. The president celebrating the vote as a victory. tudo <laughs> While Lula thanks supporters and promised to fight. Brazil now headed off to a tense runoff set for October 30th. The election, a test for the world's fourth largest democracy. Temos aí um desafio muito grande. Eu acho que foi a política assim mais difícil dos últimos tempos. Eu achei que de, o Lula...
Lula poderia ganhar de primeiro turno para a gente não ter que passar mais um mês de sofrimento. Experts say voters have been bombarded with misinformation and accusations of electoral fraud on social media, while President Bolsonaro and his allies repeatedly cast doubts on Brazil's voting systems. There's this aggressive discourse which his supporters have absorbed and are carrying out, much like the discourse that Trump has carried out in the United States. I think that if he does, in fact, lose in the second round, this would certainly be the basis for him to then challenge the final results and then create uh, the big lie in Brazil about the, the questions of the validity of the elections. This election could be Lula's big comeback. After two very popular terms in office from 2003 to 2010, De Silva is credited with building an extensive social welfare program that helped lift millions out of poverty and helped Brazil become a leader in global exports, but also allegedly entangled in his party's involvement in widespread corruption, including a 2018 conviction on money laundering and corruption charges. After serving more than a year, a Supreme Court found he was denied due process, allowing him to walk free. Lula now hoping to join the growing number of leftist leaders who have been elected into power across Latin America, promising to end deforestation in the Amazon, tackling hunger in the region, and fighting fast-rising inflation. <laughs> Meanwhile, the current president is seeking re-election on the promise of maintaining family values, opposing abortion and the legalization of drugs, and speaking out against LGBT rights. A polarizing figure in Brazilian politics, his administration has been marked by incendiary speech, challenging of democratic institutions, massive deforestation in the Amazon, and a widely criticized handling of the COVID pandemic with almost 700,000 deaths in Brazil. Now, with a runoff set at the end of the month, more than 120 million eligible voters will decide the future of Brazil. A gente conhece, sim, uh, o governo dos dois. Eu não vou dizer que eu fiquei feliz com nenhum dos dois, mas o brasileiro ele tem esperança, né, por dias melhores e a gente acredita. All right, with that, Gotti Schwartz joins top story tonight from Los Angeles. So, Gotti, so much of the world in the U.S. will be watching this election because of the implications. Can you game out for us what happens if either candidate wins? Let's start with Lula. Well, if Lula wins, you can expect diplomatic relations between Brazil and China to start improving very quickly, Tom. In the past, Bolsonaro has been a vocal critic of the Chinese influence in Brazil, uh, despite them being their biggest trading partners. However, Lula has historically said China is the world's fastest growing economy, and Lula has also been much more open to establishing more dialogue uh, with neighbors like Venezuela. Uh, while we did see Bolsonaro break off diplomatic ties with the Maduro government, uh, if Bolsonaro does win. The big question is what kind of relationship could the U.S. be looking at with Brazil? Bolsonaro and former President Trump had a very strong relationship. In fact, Trump told Brazilians to vote for Bolsonaro, and it is important to note that Brazilians also vote for their president every four years, just like we do here, except their presidential elections fall during our midterms. So a lot of this is going to depend on who we see in the White House uh, in 2024. Tom? Gotti Schwartz for us. Gotti, we appreciate it. And staying with the Americas and the prisoner swap with Venezuela, where seven Americans detained by the Maduro regime for years have now been reunited with their families. But the Biden administration is receiving some backlash for who they were exchanged for, two relatives of President Maduro who were convicted drug dealers. NBC's Nayela Charles has the latest. Oh, my God. Tonight, after years in Venezuelan jails, seven Americans now free in a prisoner swap. No, and a long-awaited reunion for former U.S. Marine Matthew Heath, now with his family in a Texas hospital since being released from Venezuelan prison. Heath's mother tweeting, praise the Lord. Thank you, everyone, for taking such good care of my son. Five of the men, part of the Sitco Six, were wrongfully detained in Venezuela in 2017 while on a business trip for Houston-based Sitco. The sixth was released in March. Sitco telling NBC News they are grateful to the leaders in Washington who helped bring about their release. Alexandra Forsett's father and uncle are among the Sitco Six. She told CNN's New Day in an interview. The biggest relief and feeling of euphoria that like I could ever describe. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arriving in Colombia after negotiating the rare swap in exchange for two of Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro's nephews by marriage, from Quay Flores and Efrain Campo. President Joe Biden granting them clemency on their 2016 narcotics convictions in the deal. 
Biden calling it part of his unflinching commitment to keep faith with Americans held hostage and wrongfully detained around the world. However, the swap drawing some criticism. Senator Ted Cruz saying the release is long overdue, but expressed concern over what he calls an alarming rise of hostage taking by regimes and terrorist groups who are enemies of the United States. And Senator Marco Rubio tweeting, another Biden appeasement that will result in more anti-U.S. dictators taking more innocent Americans hostage in the future. Family that worked so hard to get the men released pushing back. I'm disappointed that, that a, a leader in our country is perpetuating this myth that um, getting our people home actually puts Americans at risk. According to the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation, at least 57 Americans are being held hostage or wrongfully detained overseas. From the side of the United States, it's of course a humanitarian issue. Diego Abente Brun of George Washington University says the Maduro regime, which jails journalists and political dissidents, is also looking for relief from U.S. sanctions. But getting Americans home needs to be a priority. Do you think prison swaps encourage other countries to take Americans hostage? The fact that it is a possibility doesn't mean that you are encouraging this to happen because, you, you know, the United States protects, as it should, American citizens. Nayela joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Nayela, what exactly were Maduro's nephews convicted of? They were known as, and, and they were the so-called narco sobrinos, which translates to the drug nephews. Well, both of the nephews were convicted of conspiring to import cocaine into the United States, both of them sentenced to 18 years in federal prison. So that means they ended up serving six of those years. Tom? Four. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the latest on that deadly stadium stampede in Indonesia Saturday night. Authorities removing a police chief and nine officers from their post after 125 people were killed in a stampede following a soccer match. 18 others now under investigation for allegedly tear gassing fans after they stormed the field. Iran's supreme leader breaking his silence after weeks of protest. The Ayatollah saying the U.S. and Israel planned the protest to destabilize Iran, but providing no evidence to support those claims. Those demonstrations began weeks ago after a young woman died in the custody of Iran's morality police. The Supreme Leader adding her death, quote, pained him. This weekend, fresh protests overtaking a college campus in Tehran, at least 300 students detained. And then update tonight on the economic turmoil in the UK. You may remember we brought you this story last Friday. Prime Minister Liz Truss scrapping a controversial tax plan after fierce backlash. The PM announcing her government would abandon her plan to cut taxes on top earners. That policy ignited a firestorm last month and sent the British pound into a free fall, reaching historic lows against the dollar. After the reversal, the pound returning to roughly the same value it had before the policy was announced. And coming up, one for your soul here on Top Story. Remember the first day of school jitters? Well, little Elise heading to kindergarten got one big surprise. Her guardian angel showed up. We'll tell you about this powerful reunion right after this break. Finally tonight, the first day of school surprise. One Minnesota five-year-old starting class with the help of her guardian angel, a state trooper who saved her life on the side of the road five years earlier. Carol Evans' Boyd Hooper has a story. <laughs> When you're Elise Lonsbury, <laughs> every day <laughs> is a happy day. There's just this constant energy. She's goofball. Stinky feet. But just wait <laughs> for tomorrow. First day of kindergarten. Show on. And Elise has been planning what to bring. Can you see your face? Green jumpsuit, sparkly shoes. I packed it. Carrot backpack. That's good. And one thing more. Her most prized possession. I gave it to me. Paul gave it to her. Perfect. But who's Paul? It's one of those things that I'll never forget about. Lieutenant Paul Stricker yep. of the Minnesota State Patrol. I'll always remember that one stretch of grass on 394 is the day that I got to meet Elise. That stretch of grass is where Paul spotted first a parked car, then a pink outfit worn by a six-week-old baby. We were on the side of the road in the weeds. She was unconscious. I could not get her to wake up. Dad, John Lonsbury, was at work. I was, like, looking right at her. I was like, come on, come on. Mom, Kristen, yeah. needed an angel. I had thought in that moment my child was dying. She got two. Virginia Marsh, a nurse on her way to work, 
and Paul, who just happened to be driving by, worked together roadside to keep Elise alive until the ambulance arrived. They're heroes, yeah. They are. The virus that had stopped Elise's breathing kept her in the hospital for five days after her heroes kept her alive to live the rest of her life. Something touched all of us that day that made our paths cross for the right reasons. And it was a blessing. Elise, while you are too young to understand. This is the letter Paul sent Elise one year later. I will always be here for you as your guardian. And this is the charm Paul had made to replicate his badge. Special badge. It's our first day of kindergarten. So along with her green jumpsuit and sparkly shoes. It's Ooh. your first day. Ooh. Elise accessorized. The badge. Accessorized with her badge. Yeah. How are you? Oh, oh, good to see you. And the man behind it. You ready? And she's very excited. Have you met any of your classmates yet? Elise's mom first mentioned this in jest, as in, wouldn't it be cool? All right. To which Paul responded, wouldn't it be right? Five years ago, I would have never oh, guessed that we'd be doing this. To have Paul here is really special for her. I hope she never forgets the moment. Feliz primer día. Estás feliz de tu primer día? A teacher to meet, sí. a new language to learn. You did it. And high fives. <laughs> and hugs all around mm. for her family. You have a fun time at school, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're Elise Lonsbury, <laughs> family is just a bigger Good luck. True. You have a great first day of school, okay? Mm. To see her as happy as she is today, it's, uh, it's pretty special. Mm. Boyd Hooper, Carol Evan News, <laughs> Deep Haven. <laughs> so much to remember on that first day. We thank Boyd for that story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.